Okay, let's see. Yes, we have people coming in. Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. I am going to um, ask you all as you're joining us today, if you would, let's do a roll call. If you'll just throw into the chat who you are, where you are coming from, what you teach, so we can see a little bit about who all is here. And then we will get started in just a minute. Gonna let everyone kind of pile in to the webinar. Welcome, Lily, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, that's so exciting. Look at all the people. We're up to almost 350 people in here already. So let's give everyone just a second to pile in. Awesome, look at, I see so many friends. So, so, so excited to have everyone here today. We've still got people coming in. Um, I, I guess I can go ahead and get started just um, going over a few details. So the topic of our discussion today, which if you have registered, you know this already, is teacher attitudes, experiences, and strategies towards gender inclusive language across languages. And we have some very distinguished guests that we are thrilled to welcome here today to this joint venture with AATSP um, and Avon Assessment. I am Dawn Samples. I'm the director for Avant More Learning. So I do professional learning for teachers, districts, and organizations um, in education. And I'm joined today with my colleague, Nick Gossett, who um, works with our higher ed. He's a higher ed specialist at Avant. And I am going to introduce um, one of our partners, who's my co-moderator today, Rachel Mamilla Hernandez, who is the current president of AATSP. Rachel, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And Rachel, I am going to turn it over to you to do the introductions of our guests in just a second. I wanna let everyone know who's coming in that um, this is being recorded. So if you or someone you know wants to be able to watch it later, you will be able to access this recording later. Um, and we, you will be receiving an email tomorrow that will have the link to the recording. And it will also have a link to a folder where you'll have access to your certificate of attendance for today's webinar. And you'll also have access to the chat, so you'll be able to go in and look at any resources or materials that are shared in the chat today. And I hope you all will please be active and engaged in the chat. Um, we're also gonna be monitoring Twitter, so if you're tweeting, please make sure that you, um, you hashtag AML webinars, about more learning webinars. Um, and also want to let you know that our guests have graciously agreed that if they mention any resources, links, or materials, they will share those with us and we'll put all of that in the folder for you. So I don't want you all to be worried about that. Just sit back, engage, and enjoy our time together today. Okay, so Rachel, without further ado, I am going to mute myself, which probably a lot of people would like for me to do that. I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to you and we'll get the conversation started um, after you do introductions. Okay, thank you, Dawn. And thank you so much to Nick um, and everyone in Avant Assessment for helping put this together. So, buenas tardes, boa tarde a todos, todas y todos. My name is Rachel Mamia Hernandez and I am the current president of the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese or the AATSP. So I am here and would like to get us started with presenting our panelists for today. So today we will hear from Abelardo Almazan Vasquez, who teaches Spanish at the Putney School in Vermont. Additionally, we'll hear from Christopher Case, um, who is a Polish professor at Columbia University, my alma mater. Uh, we also have here with us Christopher Wynn, um, who is a German teacher at Haddonfield Memorial High School and also uh, teaches at the University of Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. As well, joining us, we have Anne Jensen, who teaches French at the, at the San Jose State University in California. 
We also have Joe Parody, who is teaching Spanish at uh, Marianapolis Preparatory School in Connecticut. We have Ben Rifkin, who is a professor of Russian at Hofstra University. And we also have Eduardo Viana da Silva, who is a professor of Portuguese at the University of Washington in Washington State. So we're really thrilled to have you all here with us today. And so I believe we can get started um, with our first question, which is really, what does gender inclusive language look like in the classroom or in your classrooms? And I'll open it up to the panelists. I'll jump in first. <laughs> um, so in, in my classrooms, in my school's classrooms, I, uh, in addition to teaching Spanish, I also chair our modern languages department. Uh, and just about three years ago, um, we, uh, as a faculty, were were um, were informed that um, we were admitting our our first openly non-binary student. Um, and three years ago doesn't seem like that long ago for us to be having our first. And I, I certainly recognize that. Um, but for us, it was it was a real uh, a, a real culture shift. And so as I uh, as we as a faculty um, underwent some training to, to learn about what, what that would mean for us as a school community, in, in the language department, we started talking about what that would mean for our instruction. And so um, I was really happy that very quickly the department came to the, the conclusion that we would teach uh, non-binary pronouns and adjectives and, um, and identifiers uh, in every language and in every level, that it wasn't just about uh, teaching it to the class that um, our openly non-binary student was in, um, because you know I, I'm using that word openly very intentionally. We we're not sure uh, how many non-binary students we have in our classrooms, but we also recognize that that students wanted that language to be able to talk about their friends, their family members um, who who identify with non-binary. Um, pronouns and, and markers. And so that is one very concrete way it looks in, in my classroom. Well, thank you so much, Jill. Um, would anyone else like to share their experiences? Uh, yes, this is Ann Jensen. Can you hear me? I'm joining by phone. Yes, we can hear you, Ann. Yes, yes, yes. I taught French at Gunn High School in Palo Alto for many years. And um, I retired in 2015 before non-binary pronouns really became um, relevant in classes. However, I currently teach at San Jose State University in the teacher education program where I, I actually teach a methods course, course for credential candidates of French, German, Spanish, Mandarin, and Japanese. And in that class with my student teachers, we also talk about um, using non-binary pronouns because obviously in French and Spanish and German, everything is gendered. Um, you know, there's he, she, and it in German, and everything is masculine or feminine in, in French and Spanish. So in my French classes, I would have, although I'm not currently teaching French, used the EL form, I-E-L, which is the gender neutral form that the French use. And I would also tell my students that you know, this issue is prevalent all over the world. And unfortunately in California, in general, we're a very open state. And so students feel pretty safe about revealing their identities. But unfortunately in other states, this is not necessarily the case. So this is what happened at Gunn High School actually, and what I currently do at San Jose State University. Well, thank you so much. And Ben, would you like to um, share your experience? Sure. Um, so my, my experience um, is actually sort of out of the classroom in the sense that um, I have held leadership positions for a number of years. And um, I last summer was getting ready to teach first year Russian for the first time in over a decade. And in order to prepare for that, I wanted to learn about strategies that others in the field are using 
uh, to make um, the Russian classroom more inclusive for people who identify as non-binary. And Russian, uh, like what Anne was describing, is I think more, more highly gendered than the Romance languages um, and, and possibly along the same lines as German and Polish. Um, and the last time that I taught, when I, in the past, when I've taught first year Russian, I've, I've often begun class with um, the, the semester um, with just asking students if they are a student and saying, I'm a professor to try to get language going that's, you know, involves some cognates and the very word for student in Russian comes in two flavors, the masculine version student and the feminine version studentka. So right away, um, you know, before students have a chance to negotiate anything else, um, this gendered binary is, is, is right there, right up front. Um, so to prepare for this experience and to be um, more inclusive than I knew to be a 10 or 12 years ago, I reached out um, to colleagues on a global listserv for Slavists to ask for resources um, uh, for um, students and for teachers of Russian about pronoun options so that I could be prepared for the diversity of students in my classroom and be respectful of them and inclusive of them. And um, I did get some very helpful information about the pronouns that non-binary individuals who are native speakers of Russian are using themselves and, and they vary. So there are lots of options. Um, but I also got a flood of hate mail to me on the listserv. Um, and Chris, you may have seen it, um, as well as um, hate mail to my um, hofstra.edu email address that wasn't posted to the listserv. Um, I am a cisgendered straight white male. I hold the rank of professor with tenure. I am a prominent professor of Russian in the United States. I'm very secure in my professional position. Um, but the hate mail that I received was a sign of the homophobic and transphobic rage um, in my profession around the world and in the world more generally. I experienced a tiny bit of it from a place of great security. Um, and it made me shudder and it made me think about how it might feel for an assistant professor without tenure, a lecturer, an adjunct instructor, a graduate student teaching assistant, an undergraduate, a student in high school, middle school, or elementary school, all of whom hold far more precarious places in the power dynamic of the educational system in which they teach or study. And that just made me redouble my efforts to do what I can to make sure that every student feels welcome, safe, and included. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Abelardo, did you have a, a comment you'd like to make? Buenas tardes a todos, todas y todes. Gracias por la plataforma, el espacio, and for everyone to joining us this evening. As my colleague and good friend Ben mentioned, I think it is also important to acknowledge our positionality before talking about these uh, conversations. And when I say positionality, again, uh, echoing the sentiment, soy hombre, soy mexicano. Soy, tengo papeles, tengo mucha seguridad en mi trabajo. Y soy una persona cis-het. And that is extremely important to say because alongside these conversations about what does it mean to honor and validate all of our identities present in our classes, I feel that it's also important to examine this as an opportunity to redefine what does it look like to reimagine what it means to be a man these days, to be a cis head man. How do we combat and how do we present our students with a very different perspective of things outside of the heteronormativity, outside of the binary, the romantic relationships that we present in our stories, in our textbooks, and sometimes how family, the structures, the culture, that could be harmful too. And we don't know that until we do the examination, we do an audit of these materials that could be perpetuating these uh, conversations. So I feel that 
um, that could be a conversation started, not only acknowledging pronouns, saying todos, todas y todes, that's just the tip of the iceberg, is how do we create this, this visibility without putting a target in people's backs? How do we create a safety for our students? Because where we teach, these are bubbles, these are oases. But when folks are out there, when folks are, as Ben was mentioning, uh, experiencing all the hate and all the uh, discrimination, the transphobia, the bigotry, that's a different conversation. Thank you so much for the platform and looking forward to learning and hearing from everyone. Before before we go on, I just want to um, just pipe in to let you all know, those of you who are asking questions in the Q&A and in the chat, I'm taking down your questions and I'm sharing them with the panelists and we will try to get to all your questions today. If we don't, we will work with the panelists to get responses for you to those questions. So just know that as we go around, we see your questions and we're going to work on getting them answered for you. Um, Okay, and I'm also going to push a poll out in just a moment, just to kind of see who we are in terms of what levels you teach, but I want the conversation to keep going. You guys can just do the poll and dismiss it, and then we'll come back to it in just a little bit and look at that. Okay, go ahead. Keep going, guys. I would like to add that for me, it looks gender inclusion. Well, first of all, I'm Eduardo Diana da Silva, and I'm at the University of Washington. In, in Seattle, and I'm gay, and I'm Brazilian. Um, I, I think this is the, the conversation around inclusion. Uh, it's very much um, a process. It's not something that's completely done that we know all the answers for. Uh, for me, I understand that I have the privilege of being in Seattle. That's a very progressive city. And, um, and I think I learned from, from students and I really mean that. Uh, when I first heard that you can learn from students 20 years ago, I used to think, what is that about? I cannot learn from a student. And now I'm actually learning from them because their understanding of uh, gender identification, it's much more fluid than my understanding of gender identification. And they don't have so many hangups around that as I do. Um, and, and from having students who are non-binary and from having students who are trans and, and LGBTQ students and, and female students that are also very accepting and male students as well that you know identify as, as cisgender, but they are very accepting of other uh, gender identifications. I've learned from them and I have incorporated that in my teaching uh, in the past few years. Uh, that would be my first thought on the subject. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Christopher, did you want to add something? I saw your hand raised. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll jump in here as well. And um, uh, like Eduardo, I um, think that this is a process of learning from the students and my involvement in this topic and my, I think, presence in this webinar um, owes itself entirely to the uh, curiosity of students, the sort of the energy of students, the desire to, um, you know, sort of um, exist in a, I suppose, more uh, gender um, equ equity world. And so the, uh, the ex exploring and the experimentation with pronouns um, comes a lot from those questions that are asked on the first day of class. Um, and I see some of the questions coming up in the chat here. And so, um, you know, it's a new world that we as language instructors are in. Um, you know, we're so used to teaching uh, you know, gender and sort of normative things, as Ben said, you know, student, you know, it comes in two flavors, male and female. Um, and students are expected to, um, I suppose, conform to one of these, uh, one of these things that are simply handed to them as, uh, you know, these fairly rigid designations. And so um, uh, it's a um, um, challenge as a language teacher to kind of push back on one's own experience and one's instincts and one's um, you know, a sort of ingrained uh, strategies for teaching over the years. And so I just wanted to say here as, as in the opening question that I really um, think that this is a collaborative situation uh, and that it's the students themselves, I think, as also, um, you know, Joe pointed out, you know, the entire 
um, you know, uh, impetus comes from, you know, people entering education programs, education systems, foreign language classrooms, and wanting to express themselves uh, in a way that feels empowering. And so um, we as educators are um, uh, responsible for meeting that. And it actually is quite exciting because then we ourselves get to experiment with our own languages and um, sort of engage, um, uh, you know, new ideas about gender and language. So oh, well put, Christopher. Uh, thank you. Um, and just going to our other Christopher, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything, Christopher Wynn. Thank you. Um, I would I would say from the public school classroom perspective that the teacher has the responsibility for the safety of the children in all of its forms and um, teaching young people who are still considering their identities, dabbling in identities and trying to figure out their place in the world, we have a special responsibility to make the classroom safe. I teach in a particular school where I think every single student has a rainbow, something on his or her book bag, jacket, shoes, everywhere, um, and that creates an atmosphere. And uh, I'm teaching particularly a class of freshmen this year, and they write a journal each week. And in the middle of the year, one of the students wrote in the journal, I told my family this weekend that I'm non-binary and they were accepting of me. I told my friends they were accepting of me and I wanted to tell you. And so I was given then a tremendous opportunity to know something and to make the classroom a safe space to hold the student. And that was a great time to remind us that the German language, which I teach, is attempting to make um, inclusive pronouns part of the regular discourse. And so we had the opportunity in the classroom uh, as it was presented to us to think about inclusion in a very specific way. Thank you so much, Christopher. I, I, that's really a, a very um, touching story. And I, I really thank you for sharing that experience with us. So in general, how are the attitudes and strategies towards gender, neut gender neutral language voiced in different languages? And I see a lot of sort of similar questions um, popping up in the chat. So if some of you want to share how the gender neutral um, language is voiced in the languages you teach, that would be great. I can start can, writing. Yeah, go yes. ahead. I was reading one of the questions and I'm almost positive that it's a similar case in many other languages. Uh, some folks out there are afraid of uh, changing the morphology or the, the structure of the words to not going against the prescriptivist rules from Real Academia de la Lengua. I see this as baby steps. I see this as a way to ungender the language within falling into creating a list of synonyms and adjectives and nouns that are already genderless. Spanish language, it's so rich that if we create the stretches from damas y caballeros to hola mi gente, instead of using hola a todos y todas, just using hola, gracias por estar aquí, switching intentionally the, the, the message without uh, acknowledging the hypergendered nature of the Spanish language is a technique. It's uh, in English, I believe it's the same when people used to say actor and actress, or people say it's just an actor or waiter or waitress, it's just a server now. So learning those little uh, words that are already genderless, it's a first step. But some of us who are really wanting to make the disruption, who want to make a statement that we are using ages, todes, chiques, pibes, there are so many ways of doing this because we are in the, in the mindset that Real Academia Española is not going to come here and show us the red card, the yellow card, like, oh, you're using the bad language. But we are using it for the safety, for the welcoming, for the sense of community building in our classrooms. And that stays right there. So that will be my testimony, whatever we do. Thank you so much, Abelardo. Uh, Christopher, would you like to add something? Yeah, sure, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to um, say something 
maybe to come at it from a uh, a, a slightly more conceptual direction. And um, you know, I think that it's noteworthy that the debate about uh, gender inclusive pronouns has arisen in a language that uh, operates with natural gender, English. And uh, my colleagues and I who are here, we are all working with languages that have grammatical gender. And so in a sense, it immediately becomes a, um, you know, a, a question uh, from the very get-go as to how we're going to handle this question in our classrooms. And I think that, um, you know, just to go back to what Ben was saying earlier about the national poll that he took on gender inclusive pronouns in Russian, I, I witnessed a lot of that hate mail that was directed at Ben. And I was struck by how much of it was uh, an attempt to defend the language from him as if he was somehow attacking the language and, you know, saying that the language was, you know, some sort of sacred, um, you know, uh, you know, thing that couldn't be changed or modified and so forth. And so what I like to do is to sort of push back on the idea that languages are, uh, um, you know, unchangeable or, or unmodifiable and to think about I think also, as um, as Avalardo was saying, you know, the richness of the gender um, usage in these languages is such that you can draw on it. Um, and so, uh, you know, just to kind of give a, a quick example here, uh, Polish has five genders. Um, it has three singular genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter, but then two very unusual plural genders, which are asymmetrical to the singular genders, in which masculine nouns, including animate masculine nouns, such as animals, are removed from the masculine gender um, leaving a strange plural gender reserved only for male human beings. Um, and so that sounds very sort of archaic and patriarchal, and it certainly is. But also on the other side of that, there are um, a whole series of masculine professions, which are essentially in grammatical drag, which um, take feminine endings while also having a feminine, I'm sorry, a masculine adjective. Um, to add to that, the, the word for person is feminine, whether it refers to a man or a woman. Um, and at the same, and then finally, if you have a mixed gender group, especially a mixed gender group with a numeral, then everyone in the group defaults to neuter whenever interactions are described. Um, so at a sort of a basic everyday level in Polish, uh, sort of biological, sort of male or you know uh, people assigned male at birth will have at least three different grammatical genders referring to them, at least in the third person, and and women can have four different different genders referring to them. So. Um, you know, and it's not, this doesn't go unrecognized by native speakers, you know, native speakers encounter this and it comes up in, um, you know, everyday situations because of, you know, uh, normal human interaction and people comment on it and it becomes a, um, a sort of running joke about the, uh, the sort of, um, uh, complexity of the language. And so what I like to do is to sort of, you know, push on that and show that the, the gender richness of the languages is much more. Uh, complex than, uh, than say, um, sort of, I suppose, transphobic or, or genderphobic archaic um, speakers would like to think. Um, and uh, I also find that to be a little bit liberating for the students because, you know, coming from English, uh, you know, the wonderful thing is that we have the ability to apply gender neutral language. Nevertheless, it comes off um, in many instances as a sort of a one to one equation that this gender needs these pronouns and this gender needs these pronouns. Whereas in a language like Polish, as I said, you know, masculine human beings will have three different genders referring to them. So the fluidity um, between gender and language as a convention, I think is something that can be really uh, pulled out of all of our languages, Spanish, French, Portuguese, German, Russian. Um, we can use the language itself as a resource, as a template, as a toolkit. Um, as a pool of experimental forms to push back against English and just demonstrate the, the, the conventionality, the fluidity, the, um, the uh, you know, the, the um, I suppose the creativity really uh, that is possible um, in the foreign language classroom. Uh, and students are at the forefront of this. I, I think as, as also Ben pointed out, you know, what do Russian non-binary speakers do? What do Polish non-binary speakers do? It's still open-ended. We don't have established forms yet. So students themselves, um, can establish their own forms uh, and, and come up with what they prefer to be called. Uh, so in any case, just to say that the languages themselves can become a conceptual basis for um, new experimentation, new creativity, new forms in the foreign language classroom. Those are such excellent points, Christopher. And I, coming into this webinar, having known nothing about the Polish language other than it was spoken in Poland, I'm fascinated uh, as a self 
proclaim language nerd. Um, so Ben, would you like to add in uh, yeah, some um, comments? Yeah, so um, uh, I, have, I have two brief comments um, and one of them is gonna connect directly to what Christopher just said. Um, but first I wanna remind everyone that one of the wonderful things about teaching world languages is that our students come into our classrooms at any level with the freedom to create a new identity for themselves. So I, as a professor of Russian, always invite my students, you can decide to be called whatever you want in this classroom. You can have your name in the name you use in English be your name in Russian class. You can have it be a Russified version of that. You can have your name be the, your American English language name with a Russian accent or not. And you can pick a Russian name or an Italian name when we're studying Russian, whatever you want, you get to choose that. And as a sort of a side and funny note, uh, my daughter, as a complete shock to me, decided that she wanted to study Russian in college. This was not at all, you know, on the agenda at home. And she wound up majoring in it. And she, um, she didn't want any of her classmates to know that her, prof that her dad was a professor of Russian, even though all her, all her faculty knew, because I knew all of them. It's that, you know, our world is small. And at, there's this one point where her in, her in her study of Russian, when her, her teacher said to her, they were learning how to talk about what someone does for a living. And, you know, what does your mother do for a living? And what does your father do for a living? And she answered, my father is a sales clerk in a store. And the, and the teacher raised her eyebrows and said, your father is a sales clerk in a store? And my daughter reports that she said, yes, my father is a sales clerk in a store to make sure that the teacher wouldn't out her, right? Um, they were using a textbook in which in the um, preface, I'm personally thanked by name uh, for having helped the authors of the book. So at any, you know, if any teacher, if any student had looked, they would have seen. But the, the point being that our students create identities um, in our classrooms in a way that they don't in a history class or a physics class. And that makes our spaces that much more fun and imaginative and, um, uh, all kinds of creating all kinds of potentialities for our students. At the same time, all of us, no matter what level we're teaching, are teaching for um, global citizenship, intercultural competence, and critical thinking. And connected with all of those issues is an understanding of both the arbitrariness of language and the fact that living languages continue to evolve. And we want our students to understand that when you're studying French, German, Polish, Russian, Spanish, Uzbek, Vietnamese, Zulu, um, you're not studying a fixed object like this coffee cup that won't change. You're studying something that is always in motion. And just as an example for all of you, when I was a student of Russian, if I had used the word office or coffee break in my Russian essays, my teacher, completely justifiably would have crossed them out and marked them as incorrect. And now business lunch, office and coffee break are all normative Russian. And so the language changes and part of the language change especially comes from marginalized communities and young people. And who are students who are non-binary but marginalized people who are young. It's their peers who are changing the languages we are teaching. So we can choose to embrace this and be respectful and model intercultural competence and global citizenship, or we can try to resist it and, and ultimately be destroyed in the process. So I'll cease there, thank you. Also really, really excellent points, Ben. You know, I think it is really important to remind our students that languages are living and that they live in within all of us as speakers. And that includes learners as speakers of the language. Um, so, oh, Abelardo, go ahead. Another thing that I'm reading uh, in the comments, it's uh, about correctness and how do we say this right and wrong, but um, I would like to invite the participants, especially the ones who are native speakers as myself, as a Mexican national who came to the US 20 years ago. How did Spanish language came to our country, to Mexico? How 
the language was given to us, to our ancestors. Nahuatl, Maya, Zapotec, many of these languages were genderless already. If the participants are familiar with a group of uh, com uh, community in Southern Mexico, in El Estado de Oaxaca, Juchitán de Zaragoza, some of you may probably know this community known as Mushes, M-U-X-E-S, Mushes, who are a community that defines the social constructs of gender these days. And they're an indigenous community and their language is genderless. So I wonder sometimes from an approach that tells me like, oh, Abelardo, you're teaching the gender neutral language. So such a liberal white uh, granola left-wing propaganda. But a lot of these languages were already genderless and they were imposed by the colonizer, the invader, the invader, I'm sorry, the Spanish conquistador. And up to these days, wouldn't it be uh, an amazing sign of empathy to say like, hey, we can transform the language just to be empathetic with these communities, not only about uh, those who are uh, non-binary or gender fluid, but again, many of our First Nations, many of our communities uh, in Mexico and in many Latin American countries who didn't have Spanish as a first language and their languages were genderless already. I think it's an act of empathy and it's, it's a sign of like, hey, we see you, we welcome you, we want to be part of your community as well. We are, I wish I, I knew Nahuatl, I'm going to be frank. I wish I knew Maya, I wish I knew Zapotec. So the least that I can do is challenge the heteronormativity, el masculino genérico, for the sake of welcoming this group of people to my curriculum. That is such an excellent point and so important for many of us to remember, especially those of us that teach languages that are tied so closely to colonialism in that many of the indigenous cultures or the cultures that were brought from other places and forced into the um, places that we teach did not see gender or express gender in the same ways as the standard languages. Joe, go ahead. Could I say something else about French or? Oh, yes. Uh, sure, Anne, since you're on the phone, I'll, I'll let you go quickly and then uh, Joe, I'll, I'll come right back to you. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the French language is obviously gen has lots of, has genders in it. And one of the things that the Académie Française has done is that they have actually recognized the EL form that I talked about earlier. So they are making progress. And many of the things that the other speaker mentioned about um, teacher and actor and actress and things like that, most of the most people now refer to a server rather than a waiter or a waitress, and they refer to somebody as an actor or a professor. Um, and so the French are coming a long way, I think, in that respect. And another thing that the American Association of Teachers of French has done is that we created a commission on the diversity on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I will share the website um, with you because we have a whole set of materials on discrimination based on race, gender, religion, and disabilities. Um, and lots of resources for teachers, lots of PowerPoints, articles, um, things like that to really give teachers a lot, who are teaching French, obviously, a lot of resource about what diversity, equity, and inclusion means in French. Um, so anyway, I wanted to share those ideas with all of you and for everybody out there who's a French teacher. I can't see the chat because I'm on my phone, but I wanted to add that. And I was just going to say, you're getting a lot of thank you, Anne's. Please share, Anne. So okay. <laughs> we'll make sure and catch that for everyone. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to launch you. the poll, if you don't mind, real quick, Rachel. I'm sure, going to launch ahead. the poll. I didn't want to interrupt anyone. Just because we are getting some questions for our panelists from various levels. There's some questions that have come in from some elementary teachers about addressing this at the K-5 classroom. So I'm going to launch the poll so we can get an idea. Um, and so you guys go ahead, respond to the poll, and I'm going to let Rachel, you go back with Joe and... Um, and Christopher, while everyone responds, and then we'll go back and look at the results in just a minute. Great. Thank you, Don. And, and I, I love that idea um, and what 
AATF has done. And I definitely am going to give some homework to my AATSP colleagues. Um, so go ahead, Joe. Yeah, no, thank you, Rachel. Merci. Uh, I think that's a that's great. Uh, kudos to AATF. Um, I uh, wanted to say, and I, I thank Ben and Abelardo and, and uh, my fellow panelists for reminding me about um, about acknowledging one's positionality, um, because as uh, as our school decided as a language department to start uh, adopting non-binary language, uh, I first had to recognize that I am I am cisgender. I am I am not a, a non-binary or a transgender individual, uh, and I am also not a native speaker of Spanish, and so. Um, to, to look into language that we would adopt, uh, I began researching what uh, LGBTQ plus communities in uh, the countries where the language is spoken um, as, a, as a native language, what they were doing. And that was how I, I, I began the work. Um, and, and that's where I discovered that this, this um, this work is being done in target language communities and it is coming out of target language communities, coming out of LGBTQ plus communities in target language communities. And that includes um, target language communities within the United States as well. Um, and so, so that was how we um, began the process um, and, um, and, and, and where we came to. So really centering the experiences of uh, non-binary individuals uh, of, and native speakers of the languages. Um, and I, I, I wanna talk to, to the, the secondary educators out there who are concerned about, um, about outcomes, right? About AP tests and seal of biliteracy tests, um, whether those are stamp tests or um, Apple tests uh, or whatever it is. Um, you know, as an AP reader, uh, my understanding is, and, and, and thank you, I think it was uh, Nick who answered in the chat, the, the Vaunt um, policy, but as, a, um, as an AP reader, right, we're, we're looking holistically at the language that the student is able to use. Uh, and so if they demonstrate control with non-binary language and they use non-binary adjectives that agree with their non-binary pronouns and their non-binary nouns, uh, they're demonstrating control of the language. Uh, and that is is well within the the rubric of success in um, you know in the in the AP language tests. Um, and just quickly, because I, I just saw a pop in the chat, we use AYE, um for Spanish in um, in our program, uh, and E as a as an adjective marker. Um, and you know, certainly um, happy to talk about this more with anyone. And I don't know if, if, if contact information will be shared, but I'm happy to have mine shared um, to speak with anyone uh, after this as well. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. And that was really interesting to know about the AP because as someone who works in higher ed, I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, Christopher, would you like to share? I was just gonna add quickly that it just takes one minute for language to change. And the example from Germany is that the largest air carrier Lufthansa no longer uses the classic traditional ladies and gentlemen when they start an announcement, they now either say um, good morning or dear guests. And the largest um, evening news broadcast no longer starts by saying good evening ladies and gentlemen, they now say hello and good evening. So a little change can have a very big impact. That's such an important point. Looking ahead, I'm just gonna jump to a question because I see a lot of related questions popping up. What kinds of tools need to be developed for teachers to support gender inclusive language in the classroom? So if anyone would like to, to share about that. I think I could answer that and I think it connects with what Christopher was saying. Um, if we change our textbooks, and if our textbooks is, is start including different gender identifications, um, it can go a long way. And one example I have with Portuguese is Plural. That's a book that's an open educational resource. And I think we can share the link. And Bate Papo is one that I'm involved with. 
in Bacio Papu, I didn't go very far, but the only a small thing I did was to put the female pronoun before the male pronoun in alternated chapters. So one chapter would start with Ella, and everything would be in the feminine pronoun, and this following chapter would be Eli. And when I started doing that, it changed the way of thinking. Instead of talking about the group as all in the masculine form, we would use the feminine form. Then back then, that was about three years ago, I would put the X's to do the non-binary. And then I came to learn just a few months ago that there are computer systems that cannot read the access for people who are blind or have some visual uh, uh, disabilities. And also you cannot pronounce it, right? So the right way to do it is to use the E. So now I'm going through the process of changing all the axes, take them out and put E's instead, right? And finally, uh, my next project is to include the non-binary ILE in all the conjugation tables and examples in the book, uh, just like we have the other two pronouns. So I think, you know, if all textbooks do that, um, if it starts showing in dictionaries, then people will start changing the way that they, they use it. Um, just like I learned a set of vocabulary because of COVID, because of Zoom, I didn't know what the breakout room was, you know, and as an ESL person, I had to learn all these terms and the name for masks and, and different viruses, all new things for me, but they are very important because this is part of our lives. We are on Zoom, we live during COVID, so there is a different language that we are learning. And as someone in the group mentioned before, these are people that are coming to our classes and we have to recognize them for being who they are without judging them. Even if you don't understand what does that means exactly, uh, it's all right. Um, you know, we all don't understand everything, so it's all right, but we have to respect people. So uh, I think it's gonna be a bottom-up process. I don't think it's gonna, this is not a phase. I don't think this is gonna phase out. I don't think, you know, this is just a left-wing crazy thing. I think this is this is here to stay. Language is changing. Just like we learned the language for Zoom and for COVID, we are learning another one as well. And we are not guardians of the language. So uh, enough of that, you know. I'm not guardian of the Portuguese language. I didn't create it. <laughs> I came to the world using Portuguese and I have a set of meanings and forms, uh, you know, symbols and meanings that I put together. So I think for me, it might be harder to actually use the non-binary form, but for kids, it's not, uh, for the ones who are just learning now, so. Yeah, thank you so much, Eduardo. And I really wanted to invite Eduardo to this panel for the work that he's done um, with Portuguese and also highlight the work that uh, Eugenia and uh, Tatiana and Leonardo have done with Plural for Portuguese because I think it is really important to, to students that textbook is seen as an authority. And even if it's a work in progress, just getting that out there is an important first step. I also teach Spanish and in a lot of textbooks, I've seen the subject avoided like, oh, we haven't decided this yet. So we're just not gonna talk about it. And I really don't like those disclaimers. So I really want to commend Eduardo and some of the other awesome work that's going on in the Portuguese language. And now I will stop talking and hand it over to Abelardo. Another thing that I wanted to mention, I'm trying to pay attention to the comments in the chat. And I will say this, I'm going to address the, I think people say in English, the elephant in the room or something like that. I'm trying to. One big reason why we're here Let's just get real. Let's just be honest for a minute. Our trans and non-binary youth is being under attack. They're being under attack right now in the United States, in Florida, in Texas, in many other states who are pushing legislations to erase their identities and their lived experiences. This is not indoctrination. This is not erasure. This is not, no, has nothing to do with that because uh, gender identity outside of the man and the woman has always existed. 
and it's very sad to argue what is right or wrong in the grammar when our students are the ones who are experiencing trauma and they're experiencing distress they're not going to perform well in classes not only in languages but in other classes so the little thing that we can do in affirming and validating our students identities just by putting an e to aj or yell or eli or elu in other languages i'm not exaggerating when i say that could be life-saving it could be life-saving given the amount of trigger warning suicide suicide rates in the country how are they spiking on earth according to the um, Trevor project, which I highly recommend people to get educated on this website, the Trevor project, the service, the, all the data that we're seeing right now, combine that with the pandemic, combine that with everything that is happening in the area of social media. I think it is time for us to shift the conversation from what is right or wrong, according to La Real Epidemia de la Lengua, to affirming, protecting, and nurturing the identities that we have in our classes. So well said, um, really. Uh, go ahead, Joe, did you have a comment to add? Yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up uh, just a little bit about my context. Um, I, I recognize that a lot of you listening this evening may be thinking to yourself, you know, I don't know if I can do this in my school. I don't know if I can do this in my community. Uh, one thing I failed to mention when I was talking about my school at the beginning is I'm actually at a Catholic school. And um, I have heard uh, absolutely no pushback. Now that doesn't mean that people above me haven't heard pushback, but it hasn't come to me that we are using language to recognize and honor uh, our, our non-binary students and community members because that is what is appropriate to do for our mission. And um, so I, I understand uh, that there can be a lot of hesitation uh, around topics like this, um, but, uh, but just know that, that there may exist more support than you expect, or, or um, you may have um, allies working around you and with you. Um, and, and that allyship point is so important, right? Um, you know, uh, from my position, I, I am um, uh, and coming from someone who, who uh, benefits from, from much privilege in society. Uh, and so anything I can do to use that, um, that privilege uh, for uh, my trans and non-binary uh, students, uh, I, I think it's, it's just so important to echo what Abelardo said. Definitely. Um, go ahead, Christopher, would you like to add something? Yes, if I could add something too, just to sort of second what Abelardo said and something that also I believe Ben mentioned earlier, it's incredibly important in published um, materials to uh, um, to uh, represent multiple identities so that diverse populations can see themselves in the you know, in the materials that they are using to learn the language. Um, in my own situation, you know, I teach Polish and I, I believe that, I mean, I have not encountered uh, a Polish textbook in which, um, you know, everyone is not cisgendered, European sort of stock, you no know, descended, white, you know, um, you know, heterosexual. So um, it's incredibly normative, uh, but in any given semester, as many as 60% of my students are students of color. And so they simply don't see themselves in the materials and, um, you know, it's a very tragic situation because students uh, see published materials as so normative, you know, if you don't know the language and something is handed to you, you, you take it as, a, um, as an indicator of, 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 you know, the way things are or some sort of truth or some sort of, um, you know, baseline identity. So it's, it's very important uh, for those of us involved in language instruction, and I know um, as you know, Ben mentioned, he... Uh, the first uh, textbook that has a um, uh, you know a same-sex couple represented, and uh, you know a part of the language teaching um, sort of narrative. So um, I'm I'm always struck by how Im imposing published materials are uh, on students' sort of um, sensibilities, and they just they just accept it as as a normative thing. So it's a very fragile and and fraught situation for us. We need to 
uh, and I encourage folks to author their own materials, which I'm doing right now, to compensate for that, um, you know, simply because uh, to put identities out there in print to begin using the forms is already to create a safe space um, for students to take the baton and then generate their own their own identities in the foreign language classroom. That is such an important point. You know, we really need to honor our students and who they are and help them see themselves and be seen in a way that aligns exactly with who they are and that affirms their identity. So that's such a, an important point, um, Christopher. And just to adding on to that, you know, we as a group of language educators can learn from each other, can collaborate. I can look what's going on in Polish or in Russian or in Spanish or in German and kind of take ideas and bring them to Portuguese or vice versa. That's a good point, I think. Yes, we all need to learn from each other, actually. I would like to make another comment if I could. This is Ann Jensen. Um, I was recently at the NEXTL conference, the Northeast Conference on Teaching of Languages in New York City, and they gave a presentation to French teachers on teaching for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And many of the teachers um, in, the, in the presentation said that they were quite afraid to actually broach the subject of diversity in their classrooms because of school board laws that have been passed, teachers, have been criticized and harassed online because of their stances on teaching for diversity, for equity and inclusion. It's a really scary time that we're in right now, I think. So the more we can support teachers in states that have passed some horrible laws, I think the better. If I could um, speak to that and some other things that um, we've been saying, I'd like to the, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, our students' identities, and um, I do want to make sure that that is centered because I think that that needs to be at the center. But we also have to be mindful of the fact that um, even for our students who are cisgendered and identify um, with one of the one of the binaries. Um, they live in a world with family members and relatives and neighbors and friends um, who are not. And one right. of the problems that we have with our instructional materials is that they tend to present a certain monolithic approach to mm -hmm. the culture and the language that we're teaching. So, you know, yeah. my, I'm, I'm in awe of um, people who teach languages like Spanish, French, and Arabic that exist in such so many different uh, dialects that can be in some time, in some cases, incomprehensible to native speakers of one dialect to another. Um, right. The language that I teach spoken across 11 time zones in Russia alone is very standardized from Kaliningrad in the far west to Vladivostok in the far east. Um, but that being mm -hmm. said, there are a lot of different intersectional identities of people who speak each of our languages that tend to not be um, represented and included. And certainly mm -hmm. the issue of class is one of them, the issue of gender, the issue of um, uh, minority communities. So for instance, mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier that Muslims are largely absent from Russian language textbooks, but there are mm -hmm. millions and millions of native speakers of Russian who are Muslim. Um, mm -hmm. and the near absence of Jews in any language textbook that's not Hebrew. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, so this is something for us to be mindful of. And for those teachers in, um, in situations where they're concerned about bringing up the gender um, uh, conundrum, especially in the pre-college level, if it is cast perhaps in the context of the broader diversity of the target culture, you know, mm -hmm. there, there are people who claim that homosexuality or uh, um, uh, being transgender or being non-binary is somehow unnatural. Um, I observe this in species other than the human being in nature. Um, what mm -hmm. I don't see in species other than humans is homophobia and transphobia. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. are the things that are unnatural. And so by um, focusing our attention on the broad diversity of the cultures we teach, 
the gender and the non-binariness becomes part of that bigger and broader and more beautiful picture. Yeah, well said. I totally agree with that. I know in French, we were trying to event, to much more include French as a Franco in the Francophone world, in the French speaking world. And so students do not just learn about the French spoken in France, but we talk about Martinique, Senegal, Quebec, Haiti, Haiti, and so forth. So we really are trying to sort of make students realize that French is not just spoken in France. And there are many people in the world, many religions in the world, many types of people in the world who speak French. And if you approach it from that angle, I think it's probably better and you'll be more successful than just treating the topic of uh, cisgender or homophobia or whatever. Um, thank you so much. And uh, just to add on, I, I saw some things pop up in the chat. I think one important thing um, for us who are here representing language teaching associations is really looking at what our associations can do to help support teachers and support inclusive language. And also, and I hate to say this, in some case, defend uh, mm -hmm. what we need to yeah. do in the classroom. So this is definitely mm -hmm. something which we all can work on and, and need to be working on and collaborating on together. Go ahead, Abelardo. One thing that I want to mention for those of us who are already on board with this, especially if you are a cishet male educator, if you're a man. I think it is our responsibility it starts with us because we are at the top of the pyramid right now. We are the ones who benefit from a system that not only oppresses women, but oppresses the uh, people outside mm -hmm. of the binary. So it starts with us. It is not the job mm -hmm. of all the trans and non-binary uh, people to keep educating and making us feel comfortable in our homophobia and transphobia. So it requires mm -hmm. a lot of um, reflection on the things that I, for example, in the personal experience coming from the sickest, uh, well, homophobic machismo and sexismo in Mexico, so relevant, mm -hmm. so permanent. But I feel this is an opportunity not only to create the safe uh, and affirming spaces for our students, but also to examine our positionality is a lot deeper. And how can we model that? Again, speaking as a cis head man in a position of power and mm -hmm. not having to worry about like what restroom am I, am I going to take in an airport or what like a uh, place should I should I be sitting or holding hands with my partner and stuff like that. So it, it starts with us, if, especially if mm -hmm. you identify as a cis head man, we can create a new conversation around what it means, maleness and masculinity. And our students will be really appreciative of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. We live in a white male dominated world. <laughs> and even for people who are LGBTQ, which is my case, uh, there is a spectrum of masculinity, right? So mm -hmm. I think more and more, people who are straight as well, they, they they don't all identify in the same way. It's not a monolithic uh, mm -hmm. identification. So yeah. the binary doesn't quite work for a lot of us, uh, mm -hmm. even the ones who you know, identify as male or female. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's just a fact. <laughs> it is what yeah. it is. Yeah. I think accept yeah. people for who they are without judging them, uh, it's a great yeah. example right. that we can give in our classrooms and in our lives mm -hmm. as well. Um, I just want to say that I've seen in publications in Portuguese that um, even people who sometimes talk about uh, these issues, they still use just the female male uh, binary um, mm -hmm. language. And it would be interesting to see people start using, you know, plurals or that are yeah. like the day form that is more neutral yeah. instead of saying yeah. he or she, um, mm -hmm. and, and using that in their articles and using that in their language as well. I think that would help a lot. Yeah. In French, we have the pronoun on, 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 which really is not male or female. It's neutral. 
And a lot of people use that to describe their activities. They'll say, on va à la plage, we're going to the beach, which means we're going to the beach, I'm going to the beach, you're going to the beach. It's sort of this catch-all term, and that has actually made a big difference in French also. Oh, well, thank you both Anne and, and Eduardo for sharing that. Um, I have to admit that I am terrible at following the chat and following what people are saying. So I wanted to check in with Dawn if there's any pressing questions that have come up that we want to address before. <laughs> well, just about 39 of them in the Q&A <laughs> and about 100,000 in the chat. Um, every question has been so relevant and so important, and I don't want us to lose any of them. Um, a lot of people have been trying to figure out how we can maybe come up with an idea for an email group. And one of the ideas that I just had was, and I don't know if our panelists would even be interested or willing in being part of this, um, would love for you to, but um, we have an Avant More Learning Facebook group and we could create a discussion forum under this topic in that Facebook group where we could continue this conversation, we could post the resources and materials there, and you all can continue to engage with people around this very important um, topic. So I'm happy to set that up. Um, clearly, we could go on for hours about this because it is such a timely and relevant and critical topic right now. Um, okay, I'm getting a lot of yeses. so. Definitely, I will work towards doing that, um, that and facilitating that. And I just want to say um, thank you to you all for, for taking the time out of your day to discuss this topic. Um, I think everyone who's attended has just had such insightful comments about their experiences. Their questions show that they've really been thoughtful and they're trying to be very intuitive and supportive of their students. And they're also trying to be respectful of the language and practices. Um, it's just, it's a tough time, but hey, it's been a tough time for a while. So we're hardy, we're resilient, we'll get through this. And I think that us being able to communicate together and you all being so willing to share your expertise, truly, Thank you. Thank you all. And, and Nick, thank you and Rachel and Sherry for working on getting these wonderful panelists together for us to have for this event tonight. Um, who knows, we may need a part two down the road because I, I really think this could go on for a while. It um, sounds no one, like it. <laughs> I really, really thank think you. this discussion thank could you. continue. So, yes, part two, part two, part two, lots of part twos. Okay, so we may need to talk about a part two if you all are willing, um, and maybe we can, can continue this conversation together. I do wanna share the results of the poll very quickly. Um, I know it's the, end of, of, it's the end of the webinar here, but just so you all get an idea, um, we did have representation from every area here tonight. So thank you all for coming and for attending and being part of this. Um, there's going to be a survey when you all exit the webinar. If you'll complete that survey, that's part of what helps us know how we can support you through these kinds of webinars. Any comments or questions you may have for the presenters, we're collecting all your questions. We have all the chat. You're gonna all have access to all the things. Um, and we may have to just move some of these over to our new discussion forum that we're gonna start so that we can continue this. Um, together. So I don't know, our panelists, do you have any thoughts you would like to leave us with as we come to the close of the webinar tonight? I wanted to say that I sent to Dawn, um, and I can't see you, so I don't, I, um, I sent you a link uh, uh, by, by email, a link to um, the, the um, AATF Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion website and Facebook page where there's lots of material. Perfect. Awesome. So we'll make sure and get that shared for everyone. Thank you. I'm going to have to say goodbye. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And thank you so much. Um, a quick message to the, to the folks who are still hanging us with us uh, this evening. I want you to know that it's not an overnight process. It's not something that happens in a short period of time. Take it from me as a person who grew up in a very sexist, macho culture 
-hmm. and it took me years to come to this place. There was a lot of painful moments and up to this day, there are conversations that I can't have with my family, my own family. But I'm here because it's not about the family, it's about the students who are in my classes these days, the present and the future students, and maybe the ones who joined us this evening. Uh, I think some of them came because I teach them and they're in the dorm. But I want you to remember it's a journey of learning and learning and relearning. And I'm more than happy to be part of that journey, just as people in the past were there for me when I was having a hard time knowing all of this. Thank you, Avila. Yeah, thank, thank you for you so being much. vulnerable and sharing that with us. Thank you so much for having me. I agree with Abelardo. This is a process. It's not something that we all know. We are all learning together. That is, this is a community of learners and, and we learn from students. We learn from each other. And I think that's the most important part and being respectful of others. I think that's the respect their bodies, respect who they are and how they want to present themselves to the world. Yeah, I think an important point uh, too is really that thinking about our, you know, gender expansive students or LGBTQ students is that a lot of times, you know, if you grow up in a family, and I heard Kara Swisher talk about this, she's a journalist, she said, if you know, you are born into a Jewish family, your family knows what it is, the experience of being Jewish. If you're born into a Black family, your family knows and can help you in this experience of being Black. For a lot of our gender expansive and LGBTQ students, they don't have that family support. So a lot of times the place they find the safety, the place they find the support is in our classrooms and, you know, in the relationships they build in our schools. So I think that is another reason why it's so important to have these conversations and to try to create the safest environment we can for them. And that's especially true for us as language educators, because by the very nature of what we're doing, we're engaging our students to express themselves. And our colleagues who teach other disciplines at whatever level we're teaching are not involved in that. And so that makes it all the more important for us to take this up, because that's what we're about. Exactly, Ben. Okay, well, I think that's a wonderful note to end this on, actually, Ben. It's up to us to take this on. So we will take it from there. Until next time, um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, I put the link to our, our More Learning Facebook group in the chat, so please be sure and check that out so you'll be able to join the discussion there. I'll try to work on getting that up for you guys um, tomorrow. And um, our presenters, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, for being with us tonight. And until next time, we'll do this again. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>